COVID-19 has triggered a global crisis causing significant public health and economic damage. At the time of writing, close to half of the world's population is living under heavy restrictions and record-breaking relief packages have become the standard news headlines. Although it is uncertain how the pandemic will unfold, but there is one thing which is very certain, that is diagnostics. That is going to take the center stage. What are the technological impact on diagnostic business ROI? How are we managing the supply chain in diagnostics? And how indigenous manufacturing will ease the recruitment process? So to tackle this very topic on supply chain management in diagnostics, I am joined by subject matter experts. So to moderate this conversation, I am joined by Shahid Akhtar, editor, ethealthworld.com. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Shahid Akhtar, editor, ET Health World, welcoming you all to ET Health World's India Diagnostics Virtual Summit. We are here for the panel discussion on supply chain management in diagnostics. Today, the panelists are Professor YK Gupta, former head pharmacology and dean, Ames, Delhi, and currently he is the principal advisor to the Institute of Biotechnology, Government of India. He is also the president, Ames, Bhopal. Next, we have Dr. Vidur Mahajan, head R&D, caring diagnostics, a part of the Mahajan imaging. Mr. Bhaskar Ghoshal, Vice President, Procurement, Newberg Diagnostics, and Mr. Pradeep Mishra, GM and Head, Central Procurement and Supply Chain, Paras Hospitals, Delhi. Before we begin with the supply chain, let's take a look at the most crucial element, the testing kits for COVID-19. May I request Dr. Gupta to tell us how these indigenous testing kits can make a difference, and also what would be the current and future strategy for COVID-19 testing? Thank you very much for asking this question. And I think India has done very well in meeting the challenge of developing indigenous kit for testing COVID-19 infection. There was a situation in March, before March, there was not a single kit available in India for testing COVID-19. And we had to get everything imported from China, Korea, and other places. And today, I'm happy that uh, DCGI has uh, almost approved 2,225 kits for testing, validation process. And Indian Council of Medical Research is continuously validating the new kits which are made in India. We have developed for the first time the kit, which is a rapid detection kit in developed in totally indigenous pre-mixed uh, reagents in Calcutta and now a couple of uh, reagents have been validated by in All India Institute of Medical Sciences, NIV Pune and other institutions and it has been approved. The challenge here is a three I would say, is the efficacy, the sensitivity, specificity and the cost. And these three things we had a bad experience with the imported Chinese as you know that we have to call back them and now we are confident that what the kits we have and are made in India, they are sensitive, they're reliable, and they also fit well into what is called a supply chain management system. Because one of the challenge in these kits is transportation. This requires a cold chain, and these indigenous kits can sustain much better. And uh, today, the the companies like SD Biosciences is making kit, started making kit in Manesa. And what they say that uh, nearly 5 lakh kits are testing facility, testing kits will be ready for every week, which will, I think, which India will become totally self-sufficient. And that is a very good sign. Now let's come to the role of supply chain in building new models of diagnostics as we see it today. Maybe we can with uh, Dr. Vidur Mahajan. Nothing is possible without a supply chain, right? Like uh, we can do, uh, you know, we can quantificate as much as we want, but if we don't actually get the kits or don't actually get uh, the, all the associated, uh, you know, like the kit is just one part of it, right? If you visit any lab that is doing RT-PCR testing, uh, for COVID-19, you'll see there are a lot of other things also. You need these tips, right, which 
uh, when you are pipetting out um, uh, the literally the the viral transport medium from one tube into another tube, you need what is called a pip uh, a pipet. car tip which is attached onto the pipet where do they come from right all of them also require a full supply chain system around them so that uh, from the manufacturers to the cities city hubs to each of the labs all of these things can reach so uh, so uh, i i you know i without going into uh, too much detail like nothing is possible without the supply chain uh, i would just like to point out one uh, you know i agree completely with what dr vikay gupta has said around uh, cold chain and uh, you know we are now trying to move to a situation where uh, there is preference for reagents that don't require uh, cold chain and the cold chain is also at of you know three types right one is where you don't need a cold chain so your uh, reagents can be transported at room temperature the other is where reagents are transported at 2 degrees to 8 degrees and the third is where reagents are transported at minus 20 degrees uh, each one of these are progressively costlier and progressively more chances of error are there in these supply chains so uh, for example we recently moved to a rna extraction system uh, by a korean company called genolution where one of the determinants of procure of purchase for us was that the rna extraction kits don't need a cold chain they can be stored at room temperature so literally i can you know i can store them in this room i don't need a dedicated fridge which requires power which requires electricity this is the uh, the role and you know it's a very closely intermingled uh, system that uh, has everything has to work in order uh, for a patient to get that final report as to whether they have covid or not uh, so supply chain is tremendously important the so room temperature will be the next normal i think in days to come so uh, it would be a dream it would be a dream but not very far off i think no, abhi yeah. to any any prediction related to covid is generally wrong so <laughs> <laughs> now next we come to the challenges in supply chain management posed by covid 19 so mr pradeep mishra maybe you can throw some light on this the challenges that you see thanks for the question uh the there are there are a lot of challenges uh being faced by the supply chain uh people who are responsible for supply chain uh, of the uh, lab items of the diagnostic items so so the major challenge is that uh, there is unavailability of the uh, major uh, kits unavailability unavailability of the consumables which are associated with the kits then uh the la- lack of the infrastructure like dr vikay gupta vikay gupta uh, told the, uh, about uh, you know uh, temperature monitoring so uh, these challenges needs to overcome in order to have full fledged uh, testing capacity developed by india so uh, companies like sd biosensor have come uh, come up with the kits so these challenges i think in near future we will be able to cope up with these challenges but there are the consumables which are associated with the kits the consumables like there is shortage of gloves also there is shortage of earlier there was a shortage of masks also though these are not part of the diagnostic uh, you know uh, equipments but they are equally important uh, for uh, you know uh, testing like gloves and masks so uh, now people need to come up with the solutions to provide adequate supplies of the masks uh, adequate supplies of the uh, gloves also so i think uh, eventually uh, we are moving in a direction wherein uh, these challenges would be there like uh, for kits for consumables and for gloves but eventually these things would be overcome mr goshal would like to add anything to this challenges are many actually uh, as supply chain is uh, like dr vidur also told it is the backbone of any organization specifically the disruptions in the supply chain at this point of time when everywhere there are lockdowns happening so the thing is uh, there are almost 50 plus items uh, which are required for a covid testing the 50 plus items required various from various locations various places and especially during lockdown season it's very difficult to get so i'll tell you a typical case uh, wherein uh, a kit was supposed to come from china via cold chain uh, during the lockdown period 
and uh, it was uh, a very difficult task when the airlines are not operating the the transports are not operating all the places it is closed down so what we had done is that uh, we had to bring it in places where there are operations happening so a kit which was supposed to come in uh, in uh, say 3 uh, 4 days took almost 2 weeks to come and that also through a chartered flight so this kind of disruptions do happen in uh, in the covid situation which nobody has expected and uh, we are uh, there are a lot of other things like uh, pradeep was telling on the gloves mask uh, extraction so doing a population of testing for for a population of 135 crores it's not an easy task which uh, uh, i think uh, we have just crossed 1% not even 1% 0.5% 62 lakhs test we have uh, done till date or maybe around 3 uh, 4 days back so it's a long way to go but uh, yes as uh, dr gupta and dr vidur was telling that uh, if we have the the clear the serology test or or the pcr test where it will be for the masses then hopefully we can uh, speed up the testing capacity and it can go because the testing capacity of pcr is very less even a company big company or uh, or a big lab can maximum do a test of 10000 or 5000 test per day so going to that level it will take two and a half or maybe three years to do the testing for all the maybe even 50% of the population so there are a lot of challenges but yes india government is doing a lot of effort and uh, all the private uh, and public uh, players are also doing a lot of effort and hopefully we'll be able to overcome this challenge in a short time dr vidur your experience with covid 19 so so we are very very new uh, to uh, the you know the diagnostics uh, well when i say diagnostics i mean the lab side of things uh caring dx uh, traditionally was uh, or is a next generation sequencing lab uh, where you know heavily focused on oncology high end testing uh, high end genomics etc uh, and about you know 3 weeks ago we took this uh, call to essentially help out the government and then help out some of the hospitals uh, because we had all the equipment we had the manpower uh in fact we have three phd's who sit they all all along all day long just pipetting from one tube to another uh so the experience uh has been good for us because we came into the game a little later uh supply chains were set up by the time we came into it uh kits were available like we have never faced shortage of kits we have never faced shortage of pp we have not faced shortage of masks of course uh, you know price uh has been a, a crucial determinant but i don't think uh a price is essentially part of a supply chain discussion so so we we didn't face those challenges except for the fact that uh as uh, bhaskar ji also mentioned there are 45 to 50 different components uh that need to come together uh in order for one to successfully conduct uh, you know rt pcr testing and uh just uh mapping of those uh, components mapping of the suppliers uh, optimizing delivery because you know, we have a very small lab we are uh, you know we are not like a nuberg or a lal or an srl right so uh, figuring out space to keep these right luckily most people were not coming to office so office is khali <laughs> so we can you know we can we can literally use our office as as a as a godown uh, but uh, th- that was the main challenge of course quality of ppes is something uh, that every lab uh, is grappling with uh, you know there are ppes which are very good but then it's impossible to work in them for more than 2 hours because there is no air circulation that goes in uh, i believe there are uh, four uh, suppliers who have now been approved for breathable fabric right we are eagerly waiting for those uh, so it's a it's a evolving process and uh, uh, you know uh, there are uh challenges at every point uh one unique challenge that i think and maybe pradeep ji can relate to this is on the equipment side uh, when i and this is you know the mri ct scans x rays etc less on equipment supply but more on uh, service manpower so on on these large equipments the big stress point uh for a company like ours is what happens if our mri machine goes down 
and there is no service engineer who can reach the MRI machine uh, either because you know they themselves are in quarantine, right? Because um, most of the world is in quarantine, or because you know they don't essentially come under the essential services uh, category. So uh, those were challenges, you know, lots of phone calls to people, lots of folded hand requests, ke jane do, hume kaam karne do, uh, uh, because you know they are technically not healthcare service providers. So uh, those kind of challenges, but but the government has been very supportive and kudos to all the policemen, uh, you know, all the uh, people who were manning these barricades that they actually allowed such people to go through. Uh, so by and large, we've been able to navigate some of the challenge, these challenges because we entered the game a little late uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, Bhaskar ji, whose company was kind of the uh, pioneers in starting RT-PCR testing in the country. One of the most crucial challenges that we missed is the China factor. So what are the lessons that we have learned from this and how we can improve upon this? So maybe we can begin with Dr. Gupta. He can throw some light on quality and other things. Besides, I think, uh, I, I think China factor has been, I, I would say, is also a silver line on our uh, thinking process. We have been totally dependent on China on many APIs, on many intermediaries. And now because we realize that the China, dependency on China or dependency on any particular country can be so harmful, can make us so vulnerable. And now everybody, all researchers, the government, the industry, the academia are jointly thinking that how we can solve this issue. How we can be self-reliant on API, how can we self-reliant on diagnostic kits, how can we self-reliant on PPE. And the result now you see is that majority of the industry is developing API. Majority of the biotech uh, funding of CSIR, ICMR, DST, DBT, Pyrec, everybody is giving huge funding to industry, huge funding to uh, startups to private labs to develop indigenous technology for in enhancing the capacity. And that is why sometimes adversity can bring the opportunity. And that is what we are looking for. That is a lesson from we have learned from China that we cannot afford to be dependent on any particular country or one country, though the world is dependent on each other. But depending on one particular country, that too, when the reliability of that country is questioned again and again, I think that is the time when we look for our own sufficiency. And the result is that so many kits have been now ICMR has approved, including ICMR's own research, including CSIR, that maybe RT-PCR and maybe the rapid detection kit, which is now affordable, 4,450 rupees to 500 rupees, is it possible? And we will be self-sufficient. Five lakhs kit every week. One lakh kit, the indigenously manufactured for RT-PCR. So this will be the data which will be sufficient enough, which we can proudly say, now we don't require made in China, but now we are sufficient make in India. That's what the lesson learned. So though late, but I think this is uh, an opportunity now to translate into something favorable. Let's see how far we are able to translate this. Mr. Bhaskar, your thoughts on uh, the China lesson? China was considered factory of the world. So now the factory of the world is uh, having a lot of issues and even they are finding it difficult to sustain. And their uh, business has uh, degrown and uh, of course, uh, uh, because of various reasons, their major importer, uh, exporter was to US and India. And uh, so that is where they have got a hit. And uh, especially China factor is that we, uh, as India, we talk uh, many things about China, but we uh, should set an example like uh, Bajaj Auto and TVS has done earlier. Like uh, China has come in the market with their motorbikes and all, but they uh, couldn't survive. So we as Indians should uh, also see that in the medical field and in the medical devices, maybe reagents, uh, uh, the machines, 
uh, the kids and everywhere the infrastructure has to be much much better than china and uh, in, in especially in diagnostic and healthcare uh, industry if you see 90% of the uh, machines and uh, the kits or uh, reagents everything is imported only 10% is manufactured in india so we should be able to manufacture 90% and 10% has to be imported so that has to be the uh, future of india it, if you want to become the atmanirbhar as our prime minister has told so let's go into that direction but how to go and where to how to do it we have to be very very uh, aggressive on this so that is my take on china you, you rightly said china is factory to the world but again india is also pharmacy to the world but again being the factory uh, i mean pharmacy to the world but simultaneously dependent on china so that is something a, a challenge possibly this is the time we learn and uh, get some motivation out of this correct imagine your china experience sir uh, so uh, we have not really bought anything i'm trying to think if we have uh, gone ahead and bought anything from china we do have we we, we have bought uh, some equipment from a large medical imaging company called united imaging uh which is uh, you know now the i think one of the maybe the fourth largest uh, medical equipment uh, like uh, medical imaging equipment provider across the world uh, we have bought a pet ct scanner from them and uh, so but you know i i think given the uh, not just the quality issues that we faced with the rapid diagnostics kit i think there is also this whole uh, element of uh, are we going to war with china uh you know and i am a totally a political person i don't even read the news but that was big enough to even come into my filter <laughs> so i think the thing we should think about is uh there's a lot of things that are being built in india uh, and i may not have examples but i know that there are a lot of things that are being built in india that actually have chinese components if there is some kind of you know import ban or if there is some a weird thing that happens and these raw materials that currently come in from china are uh, stop coming in uh, i wonder how uh, our own uh, kits that we are producing are going to be produced like you know for example uh, some of the rapid tests that are also being built in india i don't know which ones but I, this is all anecdotal right uh, the the plastic uh, covering of those kits uh, is imported from china now if that is the case right we may be doing all the wet lab work we may be doing everything else but the 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 actual plastic container uh, if that is coming from china then that stops coming uh, you know what are the implications of that so i think uh, we we do need to dive a little deep uh, and i'm sure there are experts out there who who think about this stuff all the time uh, but uh, you know there is a, a slight uh, distinction between Uh, making in india and assembling in india uh, and then partially making and partially assembling so um, so that is my fear as as we become uh, more dependent uh, on ourselves uh, we do need to ensure that uh, those uh, you know kits that we are calling our own do they have components that come from abroad uh, so so that would be my my take on on this but uh, Uh, definitely i don't think we should go to war with anyone so uh you mean to say 100 make in india but with 100% indian components either that or you ensure supply of see because if we start if we go ahead and start making 100% indian components uh, i i you know it may not be the most efficient usage of money and talent and and power and all those things right uh there, there are certain things that uh, you know other countries may be good at uh, and this is very much out of my uh, you know expertise area uh, but uh, um, i think when we say made in india we should know which other countries like there should literally be some kind of dependency map right that we are making this in india but then is the paper that we are wrapping it in coming from some other country is the nut that we are you know putting on the on the on the bike for example right the hero example is that nut and bolt actually being made here or is that coming from abroad so uh, that kind of depth one would have to go into uh, as the you know geopolitical situation emerges 
No, we are very serious with the APIs today. So I yeah. think in days to come, things are going to change with 100%. I mean, no dependency on others. We China. That would be amazing. That would be amazing. Yeah. And that also strengthens the Prime Minister's vision, make in India. Yes, that of course. Hundred percent make in India with hundred percent components as well. That would be great. Sir, hundred percent demand also, sir, from within India. <laughs> That's also important. No, we are exporting as well. It's export. And export. No, just just today I heard that one of the RTPCR kits. I don't think I can name it, but one of the RTPCR kits, completely made in India, has just got FDA approved. Uh, so uh, you know, it's a it's an amazing achievement, right? A Indian kit getting FDA approval, getting sold in the US. Uh, maybe they cross subsidize our price a little bit, hopefully. A country like Bangladesh is so self reliant in pharma. Oh wow! This is 98 percent. They are self reliant. That's great. Uh, Mr. Pradeep, you'd like to add on something to this China factor? Yeah, Mr. Pradeep, your experience with the China factor? The China factor is very much present in our ecosystem of the supply chain of drugs, consumables, diagnostics, all across India. All the plastic items which are being used in, uh, you know, diagnostics are being imported from China. You would be surprised to know that before, uh, you know, pandemic, the masks we, which were being used in India were being imported from China or some other place. But in this uh, pandemic times, more than 1,000 manufacturers of three-ply masks and more than 500 manufacturers of N95 masks have come up in India. But the interesting part is that the, the machinery which is being used to manufacture these things is being coming from China. So uh, we uh, we need we need to see that we have to be self-dependent not only with the end product, but also with the components and the machinery which is being used to uh, manufacture uh, the products. Also, uh, about the APIs, we were dependent on uh, for a lot of APIs on China, but we, now we, there, the thing is improving. But I think there is a long way to go to India to become self-dependent uh, with machinery, with equipments, with uh, consumables and other uh, you know, articles. So there is a long way to go to India. Now we come to the role and impact of technology in building the diagnostic business. Maybe Dr. Gupta, you can begin with how today the technology has impacted in the diagnostic business and ROI as well. Yeah, I will comment on that. But before that, I will just add to what uh, my friend Vidur Pradeep and uh, Bhaskar have mentioned about API. I happen to be one of the committee member of DOP and uh, Indian Council of Medical Research. See, the problem with the API is uh, not so simple. In today's world, we cannot say that we have to be 100% dependent on everything. It is a mutual word, but the most important thing is that we cannot afford to be 100% dependent on any particular country, particularly when you know that this is a vulnerable thing. And what we made a list, the Department of Pharmaceuticals, BCGI and ICMR made a list of more than 50 drugs which are critical in nature. That means if the API or if the intermediary does not come, then we will be in difficult. And Indian Council of Medical Research, which I chaired the committee, identified more than 20 drugs which could be critical. That means if we have no API, then there will be a problem because there is no alternative. Now, here is the first priority that we develop our indigenous technology and then develop it. The reason why India was once upon a time independent, like most important, the, the penicillinic acid fermentation uh, products. The China, the fermenters are in 1000 liters capacity where our fermenters are 100 liter capacity. So the volume makes it cheaper. The cheap things come to India. Indian industry does not find it economically viable or economically interesting and therefore gradually, gradually these uh, units closed. That is where we have to work upon. The technology that you said, technology which also addresses volume Technology which addresses quality, and that is what you have seen the the callback or withdrawal of a couple of Chinese kit and the fiasco which we had. 
So our technology is much better. The sensitivity, specificity, that is the quality. And the what Vidur has very rightly said, India requires the diagnostic kits, which can be sustained in the atmosphere in India like less and less requirement of of minus 20 minus 18 less and less requirement of even cold chain and more and more the possibility of having the storage capacity in the normal temperature and that will because there is always a possibility when the supply chain may get disrupted because the electricity is gone the truck has been obstructed because of the COVID situation or maybe some other situation. So in that case, more robust thing, which is India centric innovation is now everybody is looking for. So huge innovation in India is being done on these strategy, not only developing kits, but kits which are sensitive, kits which are quality, 100% and kits which can be stored in Indian situation. Lastly, I would say what Vidur has mentioned is the human resource. He said that he has a PhDs. I think that's a wonderful thing because now it is the human resource intensive technology and human resource intensive testing. It has to be very, very qualified. It's not that the uneducated technologist by by a, the testing person by experience can do this thing. They have to be really qualified and that's why these testing labs have a reputation. So human resource creation is equally important. So at one point of time we were very good in fermentation and we were pretty good in APIs. Yeah. But passage of time we went on the downside and we became more reliant on China. Yeah, the, 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 one, of the, one of the important reason is the cost factor and we did not scale up our production facility. See, the Chinas, as I said, the fermenter are usually 1000 liter capacity, whereas our fermenter are 100 liter capacity. So the, the money which you invest, the return on investment, the cost of uh, per unit is reduces tremendously when you make in such a large bulk. But then when you make in a bulk, quality assurance is most important because one step cause goes wrong, the entire batch of 100,000 or 100 liter, 1,000 liter goes waste. So that is what very critical thing. So let's talk more on uh, technology, what exactly we are doing here in diagnostic business. Something more to add? I, I, I would say that a uh, lot of uh, funding is uh, provided by biotechnology to entrepreneurs, to industry, to biotech industry. I am not going to name. There are several biotech industries, small, medium size and larger, which are jointly working on. And uh, India is, I think, one of the best human resource in biotechnology now. Thanks to Department of Biotechnology, thanks to the leaders in biotechnology uh, uh, sector in India. So a lot of innovations is being done in this area. So the issue of a scaling at all, the volume. Scaling and the quality, assuring quality and scaling and doing some innovation it is not that out of box thinking. And that's what, uh, uh, that's how the price of the thing is being done in India. Lastly, I would also say, when you say diagnostic kit, kit means is a is a combination of one, two, three, four ingredients. The attempt is how much reduction in the kit components one can achieve and do. If there are 50 kits components, can you reduce it to 40, can you reduce it to 30 so that the pre-mixed things comes. So that less and less handling by less and less automation, more and more automation, less and less handling and more and more efficiency. So that is also one of the innovative things which is being attempted. Now we come to Mr. Bhaskar, your ideas on uh, technology and diagnostic business. Basically, technology is uh, an enabler in our uh, diagnostic industry. And uh, especially, uh, uh, Dr. Vidur must be knowing in the, uh, in the COVID case only, uh, you have the CT uh, doing the COVID uh, testing. So from CT, you can find out uh, the COVID uh, positive or negative test. That is one of the technology advancement 
which has happened and uh, over a period of time if it uh, goes into mobile uh, city mobile mri and go across the mass level then a lot of things can happen secondly if you talk of uh, of iot artificial intelligence these things have been uh, going on and uh, india has been pioneer in all these areas and uh, especially uh, if you see now uh, today or yesterday somebody has uh, told that in delhi ncr only we are making a uh, uh, containment zone uh, of uh, 1000 bed 10000 bed uh, bed where it will be done by a uh, cardboard so that itself is an innovation kind of thing the innovation also is coming from uh, a wrist band a wrist band where uh, a social distancing uh, if if a person is coming before uh, below 6 feet the beep sound comes so that kind of social distancing uh, can be uh, avoided and then uh, there are uh, there are police forces who can wear the mask or helmet with a with a infrared uh, uh, thermometers there are technologies is enabler and there is no end to it and uh, i am uh, a strong believer of technology and i think that uh, this uh, like uh, you have the health say to that uh, so that app also is a enabler of what we are doing it now so the all these things uh, will uh, take uh, india forward in technology and that is where we are strong enough and i think uh, we should not produce only uh, uh, only coders and all we should also go into the manufacturing part of it where uh, chinese and other uh, other germanies and italians and japanese are ahead of uh, india so we should overcome them not only as a technology coders and but as a manufacturing base and we have a wonderful uh, set of uh, startups but again I, my question is to dr gupta what are we doing as a country for the research and r and d part of it here i think we are failing we are not doing enough at the school level and at all levels you know a startup and research and r and d doesn't need at a higher level it begins at a primary class even you are not making us an inquisitive i think uh, you have uh, hit the nail and um, the entire effort of of the government of india ministry of science and technology and particularly our minister harshwardhan and we have an organization which is called as the vigyan bharati these all are focusing our energy how we can ignite the young children at the school level how we can bring the fire into the belly when it is the most fuel in that and that's why go to the school levels now the mandate of all the icmr csi or lab is also that not only that you do research but also go to the school levels and and ignite them and that's why the country level research uh, projects generation is taking place now number 2 is the the funding to startups is never before so much and so large now there is idea funding also there is a, there is every dst dbt department of science and technology biotechnology pyre everybody gives giving funding to startups the only thing is the startups need to be funded and then to be handholded and then to be seen that they convert into successful venture success rate of startups in india is not as large as it should be the reason is bigger industry the venture capitalists the people who fund these startups they are little bit shy and this has to be aggressive government cannot support endless time but they can support huge number of startups so i am very optimistic that the entire ecosystem of research is developing it has to be developed at larger pace and that's why the committee has been set up to see academia industry academia industry r&d uh, innovation where the stalwarts of industry are also partnering future is good sir with due respect to r&d uh, our uh, healthcare bu- uh, budget itself is 1.35% of gdp that needs to come up uh, sufficiently compared to other 
So healthcare as such is was a neglected. Hopefully now it should be in the top of the mind of uh, government uh, as well as the bureaucrats. So the thing is, I agree. R and D is the most important thing which uh, needs to be uh, facilitated at this point of time. So COVID, we have learned a lot. So I think uh, spendings will be more in the near future. But sir, again, R and D should be a part of the curriculum, the syllabus. We should sort of love to see that. Anyway, now we come on the technology part, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bizar. You know, this is something I feel very, very strongly about. And uh, just echoing uh, Dr. Y K Gupta's, uh, you know, thoughts, we uh, we do have it in us to be leaders, uh, global leaders. Despite the fact that there is less money that we spend on things, I think we are generally good at, uh, you know, spending less and uh, getting more out of it, uh, out of the money. But uh, you know, very very basic example, you know, in Bangalore, you have between G E Phillips and Siemens. Uh, you have some of their world's biggest R&D centers, right? That uh, I think between three of them, there's probably 10 to 15,000 PhDs in in Bangalore that are working uh, in these companies. Pure pure research, right? Pure basic science. They have nothing to do with marketing and sales and all that. The problem is that you have, you know, probably these 10, 15,000 of the smartest people in India uh, sitting in Bangalore solving problems for the rest of the world, right? Simply because it is economically more viable to solve problems for the rest of the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, that I feel it's such a strange dichotomy uh, because even in our research group, even at Caring, we actually get paid uh, to solve problems of the West and not to solve tuberculosis or, you know, not to solve malnutrition. So uh, I think uh, it's a prioritization issue that is that's slowly picking up. And, you know, these things are, are very, very slow to change. Uh, but uh, also to the point of uh, school children, like, you know, some of the code in our uh, in our AI. So essentially caring score offering is AI validation. We validate AI algorithms across the world. Uh, and uh, one of the key aspects of that is uh, text matching. Right, uh, which is basically to say that Dr. Vidur Mahajan and Vidur Mahajan are the same person. Uh, this code that is, you know, somewhat the foundation of a lot of the work that we do was written by 11th standard student who was an intern in our lab. So, uh, you know, these, these kids are, are amazing. Uh, you know, you just need to nudge them a little bit and they can produce uh, things of immense value. Uh, that that's on the R and D side. On the technology front, you know, we uh, in, in the COVID context, you know, we get so infatuated uh, by AI, and you know, even though like you know that is core to what we do, but if you think of it, the disease was discovered in December, and in March, there were diagnostic kits all over the world. Right? How is that even possible? That there is a new disease. And you have a diagnostic kit available in two to three months. Like I think in China, it was even obviously faster because the disease started there. It was simply because researchers across the world pooled their resource, resources into, you know, uh, into public databases. Data was contributed into public genome databases where everything open sourced, right? Where researchers looked at literally the ATGC sequence of uh, NCOV2 trying to determine, okay, which are the best gene targets after which RT-PCR uh, kits should, uh, you know, be developed. And hence it was possible to make uh, these kits that we are now, you know, making lakhs and lakhs of uh, in India in such a short span of time, right? So, so there, all of that is technology. The fact that any researcher sitting anywhere in the world today has access to tens of thousands of viral genomes for free, right? That's the power of technology. And the fact that a MyLab could literally make a test in India from scratch using these publicly available databases is amazing. It's, it's again a gift of technology. So I think there's, there's uh, you know, we are able to do this <laughs> webinar. <laughs> 
because of technology so uh, it's it's information dissipation product development everything everything happens because of technology and it doesn't matter if it was a 11th ka bachcha or a, uh, you know 81 uh, year old guy who, who builds it as long as it works uh, it really doesn't matter so yeah this is this stuff is here to stay you know you mentioned 11th student a student of 11th standard yeah. i wish all indian students in 11th and standard instead of rushing for the coaching classes they were motivated or somewhat encouraged to think differently come up with some plans projects research or in that would be amazing in sir waisa hai nahi na because baar ke baad matlab you know times of india will not give them a job na after 12 after 12th if they are you know great thinkers and all that so so my my very pragmatic view is that everyone should get the opportunity Absolutely. but if everyone takes the opportunity then you know we need uh, normal people to right so uh, it's a difficult balance to strike right if uh, so uh, so i don't blame the people who go to the iit coaching and uh, all the coaching classes and like i, I was one of them i went to akash institute for two years and uh, it played out well <laughs> so uh, so i think it's it's uh, it's important to uh you know balance passion with practicality <laughs> sometimes now mr pradeep you'd like to add on something to uh, uh, impact of technology technology plays very important role uh, both in uh, uh, you know all kind of businesses and if i if you talk about supply chains then technology is again very important by use of the technology we could analyze real time stocks real time consumptions and other things also i'll talk only about the uh, use of the technology in supply chain uh, as per my experience we have used technology for our benefit like uh, we have a real time data of our stocks across all our locations which is not possible you know uh, manually then we got a, we got information from for of our consumption real time so i think there is lot of help of the technology which is Uh, helping both supply chain as well as the diagnostic you know industry now finally how do you see the future model of supply chain management in days to come maybe you can compare it with the past how things were and where we stand today and based on this where do you think we will be in near future the supply chain uh, domain is there is lot of change we would we are going to see in the supply chain domain lot of things which are not available which which were which were being imported from other parts of the uh, world would be made available in india there would be changes in the kind of the kind of uh, inventory management system there would be a change the stockings would be increasing and uh, there would be newer technologies which would enable the supply chain system so there is there is lot of change we are going to see in the supply chain domain uh, mr bhaskar how do you see the future the basic uh, supply chain starting from the manufacturers uh, supplier to supplier to customer via the logistics route distribution route everything will change uh, if you have a technology uh, right now which is changing in fact if you have a e procurement or e commerce right from the beginning to the end uh, a, a manufacturer like uh, we have been telling a, a small plastic uh, bottle till till uh, uh, it is uh, sourced and the manufactured uh, the the uh, the api or anything is put in it or the syrup till the uh, customer all these things plays an important role uh, if you go it in a uh, in a uh, e platform right uh, we have been dealing with the e procurement uh, uh, very often now and uh, the supplier supplier stock we know right now right uh, sitting at the, our desk uh, how much supply uh, has a stock so we can plan the dd mrp can be planned accordingly the demand driven uh, mrp basis we can uh, decide how much has to be ordered and how much has to be kept in stock inventory so all this rather than a bull whip method which had happened during the covid crisis we have a bull whip method wherein uh, it was uh, quite half a third uh, stocking so that can uh, very well be uh, curtailed and it can uh, it can come uh, it can be formalized and there the demand planning can be done in a proper way if 
forecasting and planning is done properly, then automatically uh, your uh, cost factor, your logistics, the inventory carrying cost, everything, the purchase ordering, it will come down automatically and the end product will be much cheaper. So the question of uh, affordability and uh, sustainability at a cheaper price to the masses will be uh, very well be can be controlled. So that's what I can think of. And uh, Dr. Vidar? So just echoing uh, the uh, Bhaskarji and Pradeepji's thoughts, like I think from a supply chain perspective, future would be of a uh, broader collaboration between vendors and uh, user, uh, wherein, you know, like it is actually my, like one of my dreams is that Bina mange hi ajaye, right? That kind of situation where like, uh, there is such integration between uh, the two uh, ERP systems that, uh, you know, my vendor should be able to monitor my stock in real time. Uh, now, the challenge in that is, of course, you lose negotiating power <laughs> because, you know, they know the reality, but, but that's the closeness that has to happen. Also, I see platforms such as Medica Bazaar uh, emerge uh, in, uh, in the short to midterm. Uh, you know, which are basically online, well, online or offline doesn't really matter, but uh, avenues for smaller purchasers to uh, group themselves into one larger purchaser. So in the US, these are called GPOs, group purchase organizations, where, uh, you know, like 50, 50 bed hospitals get together and plan their procurement together. So that way they get a much better price uh, than what they would alone. So these two uh, trends uh, I, I see in the future. Now I'm coming to Dr. Gupta for his final take home message for the supply chain management. I agree with uh, what my friend Vidur and Bhaskar has said. The supply chain management, uh, I think I like the idea what uh, Vidur has said. And I would add to that, Sahi aaye or Sahi rahe. That is more important uh, in terms of uh, a supply chain management in drugs, diagnostics, and things like that. Recently, we had a big meeting on good transportation practices, good storage practices. Nobody has data in India, though there is some data in US, and that how much drug storage wastage, because people do not know how to put it. If you just do a survey of the chemist of 100 chemists, which we did an academic exercise five years back, what do you mean by what they mean by what they understand by cool, cold and the extreme cold? What do you mean by the humid? Keep it in dry and cool place. Are cool ka matlab kya hai? Ye nahi pata unko kya how much temperature exposure at 40 or 45 degree temperature would make the, the drug ineffective or less effective or less sensitive. So there are lots of preparation like uh, uh, nano formulation or the, uh, the lysosomal formulation which are temperature sensitive, which are light sensitive. And if they are not transported properly, if they are not stored properly, you can see the large uh, hospitals storing capacity Fridge bhi nahi hai, kya kahi jaga hai, thik se kaam nahi karta hai, bhi to kaam nahi karta, usme data logging system nahi hai. So this is all is into, into the supply chain. So supply chain, I would echo what they have said, that should make, should mean the timely supply, which will unaffected by the atmosphere like this. Recently, all of us have witnessed in TV, the news item, Noida ki andar, Dilli ki andar, Gobi, the cauliflower is 40 rupees kg. And in the villages, the farmers have to throw away to the cattle to consume it. That is also supply chain failure. So that supply chain is again, if you just translate this into medicine drugs, I think the things have to evolve a lot education a lot. They must understand that quality of these things 
must not be diluted and must be preserved in this supply chain uh, management system. And uh, I think nobody can better appreciate than uh, all the three stalwarts who are here because they are dealing with the, they have to be zero error regions, zero error things. So that's what I feel. Fine, sir. Thank you all for a wonderful session. Up next, we have India Diagnostic Award. So honoring the excellence in diagnostics. So join us on the other side and we have Siddharth Kanan also for you to host the award ceremony. So stay tuned. <laughs>